Hello, friends. I don't know if anybody's watching yet or not, so I'm just mumbling. <laughs> you know, one of the downsides of the Mevo system is that you can't tell when you actually start broadcasting. That is a that's a definite downside. <laughs> There we go. I think I'm live. Hey, friends, thank you for joining me today. My name's Dan. I do all kinds of artwork, <clears throat> mostly oil paintings these days. But uh, 30 years ago, I was a cartoonist. 15 years ago, roughly, I did a whole bunch of architectural renderings. Um, let me show you a few that I just found on hand a moment ago. These are fairly simple technique. Um, I, I, my, my style ranged from simple to more complex and these were all for for one particular developer. But that kind of thing, again, that's fairly simple. Um, pen and ink and watercolor. And then the crash of 2008 happened and uh, nobody did anything in the building department so I, did, I didn't do any architectural renderings for a number of years. But now I'm called upon to do some occasionally. I'm not advertising my services in this season as an illustrator or architectural renderings or even portrait for that matter or graphic design, logo design. I don't market myself for any of those. But if somebody calls up and says, please, oh, please, we want to give you money to do this or that, then <laughs> very often I'll, I'll say yes. So as is the case today, actually, the person I'm doing this for is a, a very dear friend. So... It's a little bit more than just doing it for the money. Uh, the person I'm working for is a landscape designer and builder. And uh, sometimes he has, an, he, excuse me, my nose always starts itching as soon as I start broadcasting. <laughs> I know it's psychological. And I just noticed my door is open. I'll probably have to jump up and get that in a minute. Um, every once in a while he has a customer that if he can present the customer with a kind of a snappy looking illustration they'll they'll go with the job if he doesn't they might not so that's really what's happening here today um, but uh, I want to show you sort of the process I remember the first time I really sat down to do a real graphic uh, a real um, architectural rendering probably 19 years ago I, I would pretend that I knew what I was doing of course I didn't but I pretended I did <laughs> and uh, I Really, really scratched my head said they gave me a series of elevations and I'm not working from elevations today, but still I'm working from a pretty natty bunch of uh, <clears throat> information. I just want to bring you in on the process, how, how that works, especially if there's anybody out there that is ever called upon to do such a thing. You can have some idea. How it feels to start and and I guess I would say if you feel a little bit lost then you're probably doing the right thing <laughs> oh, I can imagine a bunch of professors of, of architecture pulling their hair out at that but anyway they're not watching so we won't worry about it all right let me turn my camera so you can see my drawing table and let me show you how this project started it certainly did not start here my client brought to me, let me dig down, dig down. He brought to me a number of photographs. And then on the photograph, he came to my office and he and I put our heads together and I did a little bit of scribbling on these photographs. Got it? And then I did, uh, after he left, I started doing an architectural rendering. Here we go, this is what I'm looking for. Uh, right there, sorry about all the flipping and flopping. So this was the very first sketch that I did, uh, really drawing out of my head, if you will. I'm looking at the photographs and imagining myself if I were viewing this scene from about 40 or 50 feet up in the air, looking down at this backyard. So that was the first sketch. Then I turned the paper over and I turned on my light table, got it, and traced 
That was my second sketch. And the whole time that I'm doing all of that, I'm looking at all the notes that he and I put together. And I'm looking at the photographs a lot. And then after doing this, I enlarged it. And I, th I think this was my next sketch, I think. Oh, yeah. And then while he was here, we made some changes. So I can't remember if I did all this while he was sitting here. I don't think so. Uh, I think I emailed him something and he said, oh, no, this hedge has to change. This curve has to change and so on. Oh, yeah, there we go. And then, are you with me? Anyway, that was drawing number four, I believe. This is drawing number five. And my client came back to my studio today. And all the red marks here indicate all the changes that we need to make. Now I'm doing three or four sketches for this client. Um, so this is just one of them. So again, the red notes here are after today's conversation, and I'm ready to now go to final artwork, which will be pen and ink and watercolor. So again, how do I do that? Um, I'm going to be a little bit bold and say to myself, I think I can go straight to uh, final artwork. So I'm going to tape this illustration to the back of a nice piece of drawing paper. I don't think it's watercolor paper. Um, for, for a sketch like this, if it's really a big, uh, what do I want to say? High detail, high quality architectural rendering, I, I would use watercolor paper. But for a, this is down and dirty, not, not too finished, not too detailed kind of um, rendering. And I, my light table has two settings, low and high. And I think I'll go with high. If I, had, if, if I by any chance, still have trouble seeing that image, I can turn off my overhead light. And then I get something more like that. Yeah, I think I'm going well, to let me turn off this. So there, that's his, that's his, ooh. Nope, I don't want it that dark. Okay, and I'm going to use um, waterproof uh, felt tip pen. This is made by Faber Castell Pitt Artist Pen, P I T T Artist Pen, black. They say that it's waterproof, and I know that it is waterproof uh, because I've tested it, but uh, trust me, you, you cannot. You cannot trust the labels. <laughs> and when a when an ink says when a when a manufacturer says waterproof ink or waterproof pen, um, don't believe them. Don't trust them. You have to test it yourself. I don't know what they mean by waterproof, but <laughs> many times I've discovered what I don't know what they were talking about. But it wasn't waterproof. Okay. Now, as you can see, I have a T square here and a triangle, so I can get horizontals and verticals um, but I also have a whole bunch of curves to draw I'm trying to decide where to start I guess I guess I'll start with the the easy stuff the building in the background okay so just for what it's worth first of all you can see I'm, I'm holding my pen because because I'm using a, a triangle at the moment and a t-square I'm not, I can't hold my pen in the side saddle grip, which is unfortunate. I would really would rather do that right now, but I can't. So I'm going to use it this way. Now, uh, one of the things it might be good for you to notice is that I'm using, even though I'm using a T-square and a triangle to get verticals and horizontals, I'm still going to move my pen in a rather scratchy, loose manner. I don't know if that makes sense to you. How can it be loose if you're using a ruler? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I think my answer would be that you, you, you stroke quickly 
you use a lot of double strokes. You don't necessarily stop where the line stops. In other words, here's a, here's a, I'm doing that line slowly. Here's a, a gutter, right, underneath the, the edge of the house. And, and I'm going to let my pen go beyond that what is real. Now this, this is a little bit out of perspective, so I'm going to make a correction here. The, the drawing that I'm copying uh, was done very quickly with a um, fat pencil. In fact, let me show I have it here. In fact, here's the, the pencil I was using. This is Creative Mark. Um, can you see this with all the backlighting? So there's, there's the size of the lead, and this is just a holder. I love this tool. I just I started discovered it about a year and a half ago. And uh, it was one of those, where have you been all my life kind of moments. <laughs> so as you can see, I hope, um, by, by drawing in a loose manner, it, it conveys, oh, let me, I, I guess I'll do it in the negative. It, it keeps me from giving the impression that this is supposed to be a hyper-realistic, you know, scientifically accurate rendering, because it is not. Um, even the fact that I'm making all of these horizontals horizontal instead of in perspective, right? There should really be a vanishing point way over that way, and all of these lines should go like that. But um, I'm not. This is this is like architecture's cheating perspective, keeping it simple. And some of these shorter lines I'm going to draw uh, without a, a ruler. When I'm finished with the um, rendering, won't well, sorry, going off screen there a little bit. When I'm finished with the drawing, and and I do watercolor on top of this, um, I am going to do a little bit of cross hatching with with the pen. And again, all of that is just to look a little bit cool. Um, I don't particularly need to impress my client with this illustration. He has seen my artwork hundreds of times. Um, I am working with him. He, I'm not trying to impress him. He and I are both trying to impress his client because this is a very big job. So what my, what my client does is, well, first of all, designs these uh, landscape designs for his client. And, and then his company also, of course, builds them. He is a professional landscape builder. And I've watched him at work many times. He also chops down trees. He's also a, is it an arborist. I'm not sure what they call it, but he's a person who climbs up trees with those crazy death-defying hooks on his boots with a chainsaw on a strap and cuts down, you know, have you seen those people? They're, they are amazing. Now I'm at a point now I need to go back to my photograph. Oh yeah, there are good, there are dividers in this window. I'm glad to see it because it was kind of bothering me that there wasn't. <laughs> So all of this that I'm doing right now is, is, is quite a bit of a throwback to my days as an illustrator. I was a freelance illustrator for, well, I, I mean, what, how far do you want to go? Um, my first real freelance illustration job uh, was I was a freshman in college. And oh, I need to look up, hang on here. Let me turn on some lights and back out. I need to look up cherry laurel autolucans. So get up my laptop and do a search for cherry A L U R E L. And I don't know how to spell autolucans. A U T O L. 
you Cadians. <laughs> Otto Lukens. And usually, as is the case here, usually uh, Google says, did you mean did you mean this? And that the answer is yes, absolutely I meant that. And then I hit image and it shows me all kinds of pictures. Okay, little low roundish bush with white blossoms. At least they look white here. Okay, so again, all part of the business. So I labeled Hello, good evening, Sand Dollar Studio. Good to have you on board. So I'm going to sketch in one Cherry Lucas, Ch Cherry Laurel Auto Lucans. <laughs> Funny. Um, so as I, I was saying, that, that all of this really is quite a bit of a, a harken back to my days as an illustrator. Oh yeah, and I started, my first job was I was 18 years old. I worked for the marketing department of the college that I attended. So I was a college freshman when I really started making money. Not tons, of course, this was 1972. <laughs> By the way, if you haven't discovered, so you, 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 my fellow old travelers here, <laughs> um, there, there are a number of websites uh, called inflation calculator it is a lot of fun in other words like i can think okay in 1967 uh, i made a dollar an hour and at one point i even made 75 cents an hour <laughs> working and um if you want to know how much that is in today's terms you just do a google search for inflation calculator and you put in the dollar amount and the year and it will tell you how much uh, that that is in today's terms it's fascinating a couple weeks ago our we had gas here locally gasoline in for, at the gas station dipped momentarily just for a moment underneath uh two dollars a gallon dollar 99 it didn't stay there but it was there for just a moment a couple days or maybe one day Anyways, and I, I was very curious because the, the cheapest gas prices I can ever remember as a kid, and I think I was like five years old, so that would have been 1959, and I remember, um, I remember gas being a dollar, or being tw a dollar, being 24 cents a gallon. And uh, so I looked up, a dollar 99 here today, a, a month ago, in 1959. And you know what? It was, it's exactly the same price. It was 24 cents a gallon. That was fascinating. Anyway, um, so I was making, I don't know how much in 1972, but more than a dollar an hour, but not, a, <laughs> not an awful lot more than that. Um, Okay, I'm going to start drawing this curve. Some bull nose, same bull. Okay. The challenge, if you will, the challenge, I'm shifting sideways in my, and boy, am I drawing with one hand, right? So much for that two-handed crazy stuff. This is time for drawing with one hand. Hola. Como esta? That's all the Spanish I know. Don't ask me anymore. <laughs> That's terrible, isn't it? I'm sorry. Sorry, I don't know more Spanish. This is grass along the bottom of this wall. So I've learned a trick for drawing grass what you're seeing right there. And 
Anyway, I started to say this is a throwback to my days as an illustrator. And I, I wonder often these days, as now that I'm a painter, quote unquote, fine artist. By the way, what is the difference between illustration and, a, and fine art? In illustration, you're going to get paid for the job. With fine art, you might get paid for it someday. <laughs> That's one of the chief differences between illustration and fine art. Anyway, I wonder often how much did my illustration career impact my um, fine arts painting? What what kind of I've, I've, I know I developed many skills, but it's a little bit hard to tell exactly wh which skills <laughs> it is. On the whole, though, I think I think it was good preparation. And when I look around and look at other people's careers, I discover that um, a lot of other very fine artists, I shouldn't have said it that way, a lot of, not other, a lot of fine artists, a, a lot of very skillful fine artists uh, spent much of their career much of their life as illustrators or started out as illustrators anyway so it seems to be not that unusual a career path I'm not having much fun with these stairs here right now <laughs> I don't think I'm doing a very good job I'll try to cover up some of that mayhem with some cross hatching. Just make it make it look good. I have another plant I need to look up right now. Little gem, little gem magnolia. So here we go again. I pull out the, I usually do this on my phone, but uh, I'm broadcasting with my phone right now, so it doesn't work. Oops. Little gem, TT, whoops. I'm the world's worst typist. Gem magnolia, there we go and hit images well looks like a magnolia tree to me <laughs> sometimes with bushes with uh, with branches all the way to the bottom sometimes with a bare trunk so who knows okay that didn't help much but I just I guess because I kind of already knew what a magnolia looked like Are you there? There we go. Okay, for a second we lost sound just for a minute. I am going to end this broadcast shortly, or a pause it, I should say, and bring it, bring you back, guys, back in when I start doing watercolor, because this is going to be getting just a little too boring. But uh, the main thing I, I wanted you to see was. In order to get to this point, I had to do a number of rough sketches. I think I think this is drawing number six. Okay, the the one that we are going to show to our client. It took us six sketches to get to that point, and that's fairly typical. In fact, my friend, the man, the man who is the uh, the, the architectural designer, he, he feels a little bit bad and said, man, uh, is, is there anything I can do to make this process smoother? And I said, no, you're, you're doing great. Because I think he feels like, in, he feels insecure trying to describe this stuff to me and, you know, feels like I, I, he, he doesn't feel 
like he, he does a good job of describing, but he does. He just, in my book, this is all just part of the process. You just have to stumble through till you get it. Let me turn these lights off. And turn these lights on. There you go. So that's what it looks like at this point. Uh, I'll do watercolor here and um, a little bit of cross hatching. Looks like I, I have some smudges on my drawing from this ruler, so <laughs> it's no wonder. Look at all this stuff on the back of this ruler. I'll take I'll take a minute and clean that up before I continue. Okay, let me see comments. You guys have left some chats. Good. Sand Dollar Studio. Good evening to you too. And Noise of Depression. What a great name. Ninety cents per ninety seven per liter. And that's for Supreme. Wow. How does that compare to gallons? I'm in the United States. I'm in the I'm a Yank in the States. Yeah, the price of diesel is crazy here as well. <laughs> hey, Zamorite. <laughs> Mechanical drawing. Yeah, you, you, you bring up a point. So it, it, I wonder, because I paint so much architecture in my oil paintings, um, it may be that, you know, all the years of doing stuff like this uh, really has helped me in my painting of architecture. That, that would make sense, wouldn't it? So maybe I should be more encouraged um, that, that I took that long, circuitous route in my, in my career. I'm trying my, my light table doesn't. One of the switches doesn't work very well. All right, so I've got a lot of hand drawing over here, a lot of red, as you can see, that needs to be fixed. Hello, Rita Donahue. Hello to you as well. There is a plain old-fashioned um, trellis here against the back of the fireplace, uh, the back of the chimney with roses on it. I'm just going to try to draw it freehand. There, there is honestly a, a style, a type of illustration where you wouldn't even do that by hand. You would break out the French curves. I have a whole still left over from my illustration days. I have a whole drawer full of French curves and all kinds of other tools for drawing curved lines. Boy, talk about Zamorite art. Talk about um, mechanical drawing. I, I have done some over the decades, some extreme, uh, partly for uh, patent attorneys, lawyer, patent lawyers, drawing patents for the U.S. Patent Office, and I didn't do anything freehand. Everything was drawn, and I'm sure all of that would now be done with a computer, of course. But back in the day, we actually drew it by hand. Wow, almost hard to believe, even for me. <laughs> a okay, little bit of a hedge here. All right, time for a break. I'll bring you guys back. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you like this, thank you. If you don't like, hey, right, Jackson. I need my clapper, dude. <laughs> I, let me know uh, what your schedule's like. We'll connect up. Okay, little break. All right, welcome back. Thank you for letting me take that quick break. And, <coughs> sorry, still tail end of this cold. Let me put you on a camera where you can see what I'm doing there. All right, so finish the simple pen and ink sketch. Time now for watercolor. So for those of you who missed the first half of the broadcast, I basically traced this drawing with corrections in ink and made that drawing. And so now I'm ready to do watercoloring and I'm gonna follow the one classic approach to watercolor is you start with the lightest tones. That needs to be a little bit yellower. 
start with the lightest tones and then graduate little by little to darker and darker tones. One approach to watercolor painting. Pardon me just a minute. I change monitor ear in ear monitors. That battery, that battery died. There we go. Okay, so just a couple comments about uh, this kind of watercolor painting. First of all, I'm not working on watercolor paper, so the amount of <clears throat> The amount of water that this paper can take is quite limited. It will start curling up really quickly. So I'm being pretty conservative <clears throat> with how much um, water I put on it. I'm going to be fairly careful about shadows. This is a very sad brush, very good high quality brush that went bad on me really quickly, which is most unfortunate. I just haven't replaced it yet. <laughs> Because I paid enough for it, it shouldn't need replacing, but either I did something bad to it or it just was defective, but it didn't, it didn't last very long at all. So I, I want to uh, be fairly careful to observe light and shadow in this very simple watercolor, partly because that's what, that's what people will notice. Uh, and it'll give gives a a quick or convincing uh, sense of realism if the um, if the sh <coughs> if the shadows are consistent. <clears throat> okay, and the roof is brown. I'm looking at this photograph, perhaps you can see that. Let's do the light part of the roof first. Again, this is, I would call this a fairly uh, loose technique, loose uh, architectural rendering style, as opposed to tight or very realistic. This is fairly loose, so I can fly through it pretty quickly. Now for the dark parts of the roof, the roof that's in shade in shadow. Yeah, 
And after I do the watercolor, I'm going to do at least two things. One is some pen and ink detail and cross hatching. I've already done some cross hatching, real scribble, real scribbly cross hatching, as you can see. And then uh, I'll come back and do white, <laughs> white <laughs> um, details with a with a correction pen. How's that for low class, <laughs> low quality artwork there? Just use a correction pen. I'll show you that if you. If you've watched me often, you've seen me use that before. For some reason, I really like using flat brushes. I know a lot of watercolorists use rounds a lot. And by no means am I defending <laughs> or saying that you ought to use flat. It's just a habit, maybe even maybe even a bad habit, but it's 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 certainly a habit I'm in. You can certainly paint quickly quickly with a maybe quicker with a flat brush. Again, now looking at oh, I have part of this drawing wrong. Good to discover that. <laughs> Good. This is supposed to be a screened-in porch kind of thing. Wow. I knew this over here is, is a screened in porch. Now let me think, I think I'm just gonna paint that whole area. So to indicate uh, a, a screen porch, I just added some uh, Payne's Gray to the brown that was already on my brushes. Add some even cooler tones to that now to to do the windows and let's go to a really small brush really small flat brush I should say hopefully I can knock out these windows really quickly whoops I missed a part over there the client, not my client, but my client's client, the person who owns this house, the person who's having the landscape work done, I'm assuming is not, isn't going to be too worried about the rendering of their house. Does that make sense? All of this painting that I'm doing of the house is just background. What they care about is everything that's down here. Part of the reason why I'm not going to worry too terribly much about the uh, colors or the, the the painting really the rendering of the the house now this everything down here they do care about so here down here I need to get the colors fairly accurate but of course as all of you high-tech people know I'm going to scan this into Photoshop and if if any part of this illustration is not the right color I'll fix it in Photoshop. <laughs> we are after all <laughs> children of the digital age even if we're old children. <laughs> we do know how to use Photoshop.
I said I would be doing at least two things after this layer, that is pen and ink details, and then uh, white out, probably with a correction pen. The third thing that I now I'm thinking I will do is uh, opaque gouache. So yes, I will probably be doing opaque. A, a large a large part of illustration work like this, if, if I can put this in the broad category of illustration, a large part of this is you're not being paid, <laughs> honestly. Well, let's be real here. <laughs> I'm not being paid to do a masterpiece. I'm doing a I'm being paid to do um, an, a, an adequate, in this case, architecture rendering. So it's it's not Rembrandt here. So it behooves me to knock it out with some dispatch. I have not got all day, so to speak. And it's partly that that knocking something out with dispatch, quote unquote, <laughs> uh, that gives an architectural rendering like this some of its panache, some of its atmosphere. In a sense, the viewer, the customer in this case, actually wants to see that it was done with some aplomb. I keep using these obscure words. Can everybody out there spell aplomb? I think it's A-P-L-O-M-B. <laughs> it's not a word that you use every day, <laughs> but I do because I'm an artist and, and uh, most artwork should be done with aplomb, with freedom, a sense of spontaneity. So that is indeed what I'm aiming for. And I will definitely come back and do uh, some white flowers on these cherry laurel autolucans. <laughs> Working for this landscape builder, designer, I have learned a lot of the names of a lot of plants. I still don't remember them very well, though, because it's, it's not my job to look through. <laughs> it's too easy just to look them up on, on Google again. <laughs> And roses on this trellis. So I will definitely come back with red gouache and do some roses there. Now, my client, my boss in this job, was very careful to point out repeatedly that the top of this wall is gray gray something, gray stone. I forget what kind of stone it is. Anyway, so he was very carefully careful to point that out many times, so I better be very careful to make sure it's gray. My friend does some beautiful work, 
and there is something very special about beautiful landscaping, isn't there? And the border of the trim along the sidewalk is dark gray. Just careful to point that out. So part of what we're doing when we're working for a customer like this, in this case, part of what we're doing is trying to guess what it is that the, in this case, I believe it seems to be the woman of the house. Um, we're trying to guess what it is she needs to see to feel confident about this job. Does that make sense? So it is a guessing game. We're trying to guess. Hmm. What is she, you know, what is my, my friend, my client, the architectural designer is, is, or the landscape designer is going to do a beautiful landscape design. There's no question about that. My sketch is not here so much to tell him what to do. <laughs> it's to convince a potential client that the land, that, that, that my client knows what he's doing. Is that an interesting conundrum? So I, this is definitely a marketing. I guess it's why you could call it, put it the, all under the general heading of commercial art as opposed to fine art because it's tied into a very dis, uh, distinct commercial purpose. Oh, look, I dropped, dripped some watercolor up there in the sky. Can anybody say Photoshop? And once again, the my illustration of the house. We're we're not designing a house, so that that's not. It just needs to be, just believable enough so, the the client feels like they're seeing. Oh, that's what it's going to look like. You know, that's the that's the response we want, the client to have. Oh, that's going to look great. And the people vary, extremely widely. The population. Varies in an extremely wide range of how good they are at visualizing things. You could probably imagine that I, as, a, as an artist, I'm usually, <laughs> I try not to show it, you know, but I'm usually pretty amazed when people are unable to visualize something. Of course, because I'm an artist, so I've been visualizing things, you know, from toddlerhood almost. So it's hard for me to relate to people going through life without being able to picture what something's going to look like. But I know, I know it's true because over the years, of course, I've had to deal with many clients. So that's one of the reasons that illustrators have, have work, have jobs, because we're here to help people visualize it's a TV commercial, you know, we do storyboards so that the client in the overall, oval, in the corner office can picture what it's going to look like. I'm going to, uh, pick up a hair dryer here really quickly and uh, pardon the noise I'm gonna hit it real quick with just a, some hot air so I can start using pen and ink
dry the back too. All right. Let's just add some textures. First of all, this this face here is brick. So just a few brick lines, especially in the shadows, to help convey the sense that, it, that it's brick. A little bit of cross-hatching. Actually, this is not, I use the term cross-hatching loosely here. I call that scribble hatching. <laughs> I have mentioned several times in recent weeks that uh, just in the last couple months, I think I've come to a new understanding about the word skill and when it, as it pertains to artwork in particular. Um, I have typically in my career downplayed the word skill or downplayed reference to hands. Let me, let me give you my definition of skill, human skill I'm talking about. Human skill, in the strict sense of the word, refers to the, the careful, pre-planned movement of bones, ligaments, ligaments and muscles, <laughs> or the careful, pre-planned movement of body, most, most often uh, hands. So musicians who play with their hands use high degrees of skill if they're if they're good uh, uh, likewise they 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 if they play a wind instrument the muscles of their face <laughs> are highly skilled skill refers to bodily movement and the reason I have downplayed that over the years is because of an overreaction on my part to uh, a very particular ignorance that, that people in the general population have. Many people in the, that are not artists, they think that the art skill resides in a person's hands. An artist's hands might be an expression that, that they would use. Oh, he has the hands of an artist. And, and uh, I, am, I usually go to great pains, <laughs> if I care at all. To, to describe or explain that it has, I've often over, overstated the case, it has nothing to do with hands. An artist's skill resides between his ears. And that is true. But in recent months I've gone, oh, you know what? No, it, there is hand skill involved. There is movement. And I, I say that because of these kinds of lines. Um, you can't do this without practice. The fact that I'm able to do this scribble hatching and it looks fairly good is because of years of practice. So there, in fact, is uh, quite a bit of skill involved in painting. And I know most, most people would say, well, of course, I already I always knew that. And I, I, I grant you, but that's because most people are er in error. And they think that art is mostly in the hands. And I'm saying it's maybe 90-10 or something like that. One of these days, I believe, I'm going to do a video in which I'm going to be a real smart aleck. <laughs> And I'm going to do a, uh, a drawing with my feet, just to make the point, <laughs> just to be a, you know, a smart, you know what. Um, 
I'm going to do a drawing with my feet to make the point that art is in the brain, not in the hands, even though some of it is in the hands. Anyway, have, have I just confused all of you completely? Most people think art is in the hands. I, as an artist, know art is actually in the brain, but I've come to realize to a fresh degree recently that, oh, you know what, it is also in, it is also in the hands. So there's, that's what I'm trying to say. And this kind of stuff that I've just done is a good example of stuff that, that takes practice. Skill, all skill takes practice. And, and people in the general population, they use the word skill loosely. They might say somebody is a skilled writer, for instance. Well, in my, in my, the way I'm using the word in a more strict sense, that is nonsense. That would have to mean they were good at typing, which is virtually never what the, the speaker of that sentence means. They don't mean he's a good typist. So people use the word skill loosely. Um, skill refers to how you move your body. So it, basically musicians and athletes are very high on the skill spectrum. Artists, considerably less, but in fact, there is skill involved. All right, so the, I'm, I'm going to say that my watercolor is mostly finished. I'm debating whether to go straight to gouache. I guess I will. Okay, so I have my gouache tray right up here. Here's my all greens on top and all the other colors underneath. Reactivate gouache by spraying with water. Wash of gouache. <laughs> I resisted buying gouache for many years because I didn't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> now once I realized that that was the reason I wasn't buying it, I, I realized that was stupid, so I bought some. But anyway, it's pronounced gouache. What, G-O-A-U-C-H-E? Gouache? 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 <laughs> anyway, it's gouache. <laughs> and of course, it is simply uh, opaque. <clears throat> opaque watercolor. A favorite over, over through the centuries of, of illustrators. It's a very fast, intuitive. Uh, in fact, the, the, you know, the tempera that at least here in America, that most children grew up painting with in elementary school is very closely related to gouache. So very um, intuitive paint for most of us. So here again, guessing, trying to guess what is it that the client, the woman, in this case, she seems to be the decision maker from what m my client has said, uh, what, what will she want to see? How much detail should I go into in this very particular color and style and brand of patio uh, paving, right? That's the question. I don't know the answer, but I'm trying to guess. And I'm thinking, yeah, I think it, if I make it look a little bit more realistic, that will help her visualize it. We want her to look at it. We want her eyes to light up and her say, oh, that's going to be beautiful, that, right? That's what we want her to say. Um, here's a little trick for you gouache people. <laughs> or those of you who want to know about using gouache. Um, it, at least it seems to me the most frequent color that we use is the color white or the most... And, and so I don't have 
a, a white uh, well around here because um, it would get contaminated very quickly with every other color. So I just buy periodically, I'll buy a tube of white gouache just to make sure. So I have several laying around here and there. And uh, that allows me to have clean, ready to go white gouache that I can, of course, then contaminate. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to paint very many things. Oh, by the way, I said earlier that I would use a whiteout pen. Well, it turns out I may not be doing that since instead I've decided to go with gouache. So let me show you the whiteout pen that I typically use. Here it is. This is the brand you want. And maybe I'll use just a little bit of it to, to show you guys how I use that. Um, that's, that's not an office. That, I'm sorry. That's, that is not a art supply store. That's not an art product. That's an office supply product. At the moment, I'm correcting a mistake that I made several minutes ago when I was doing the pen and ink. I thought for a little while that these walls were made, were stone, but in fact, they're not. They're brick, so I'm actually diminishing some of the lines that I created during a brief moment when I was mistaken. So as you can see, watercolor painting in this technique in, in the commercial world is not nearly as um, restrictive, if I can use that word, as, as watercolor painting in the fine arts world, mostly because here I am using opaque medium, opaque watercolor. And as all of you watercolorists know, hey, that's cheating. Correct. Check. Granted. <laughs> the name of the job in, in uh, commercial work is get the job done. Now, let me look at this. trying to see what color the trim is. It looks to me like the trim is exactly the same color as the brick. Oh, and I just discovered a mistake. Let me look at that again. I've got this wrong. There's supposed to be a, a knee wall right down here. So I'm going to paint that in and then come back in a few minutes and do um, a pen and ink on top of that. So one of the things that I do in commercial work that is the same as what I do in my in my watercolor sketches is I go back and forth between the pen, pen and ink, and watercolor as opposed to what I think some people would do or maybe what most people would think I think most people would think, oh yeah, you do the pen and ink first, like you do the drawing and then you color it. And my technique is quite, quite the opposite of that. I typically do watercolor and then pen and ink and then go back and forth between watercolor and pen and ink. And I'm certainly going to do that here. Um, for some reason, just when you, when you build up the layers in that manner, um, it seems to me I'm able to achieve the look that I'm after more quickly. In fact, I, let me give this a quick hit with a with a hair dryer, and then I can pick up a pen and do more. Hang on, loud noise again. Sorry about that noise. Okay, I think that'll do it. So back to the pen. And just drawing really anything I want. Being a little bit looser than I was, a little bit more artsy, you might say, than I was at the beginning. And all of this is just 
to create a good feeling. I think more than anything else, the client, even though she won't be able to express this, she won't be able to put words to it, what will give her the best feeling about this illustration is if, is if she has the feeling that the artist was good. Now, she, she won't verbalize it that way unless she's an artist herself, which is not likely because we are doing this job precisely because this particular client doesn't seem to be able to visualize things very well. So she probably won't say, oh, yes, he's a good illustrator. No, 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 no. What she will say is like, oh, that looks good. And what she will think she's being impressed with is um, maybe the realism would be one way to put it. But you and I know that that, in fact, is not what is impressing her. What actually is impressing her is the fluidity, the confidence of the strokes, the lines themselves. She has to get a feeling, or I want her to get the feeling, that the artist knew what he or she was doing. And, and so at this point, the marks that I'm making are, are actually not terribly concerned with realism or accuracy. More than that, I just want them to have a nice feel. I use the word panache. I should look that up sometime. I know I'm using it properly, but I, I do wonder what is the technically literal definition of the word panache. <laughs> I think it's French. The French have a lot of panache. <laughs> We're getting there. I'm going to do another layer of gouache. Tell you what, before I do that, though, let, let, let's uh, grab this correction pen. Uh, and these are cherry laurel auto lucans. <laughs> I had to look that up today. What is a cherry laurel? But they have little white blossoms that kind of go out in a spear shape. Uh, from the center of the bush. That's what that's what I have learned today. That's what cher cherry cherry laurel autolucans look like. So that's a perfect way to use uh, this whiteout pen. A little bit faster than gouache, a little bit more opaque than gouache. And this bush right here is a magnolia. So I Let's do the magnolia blossoms, which at this distance appear basically as uh, white dots. But these down here are white spears. This client, this homeowner, uh, one of the characteristics from my from my point of view and, and my my client is she she uh, doesn't like a lot of variety. She likes sameness. She's, she's using this cherry laurel autolucans front and back. Now I'm doing where the sun, sun is coming from the left here, of course, in this illustration. And uh, so I'm just doing some light highlights on the left sides of things. Just as really as I do in my fine arts painting, I want a slight exaggeration of light effects. Slight exaggeration of play of light. Again, that will give the, the client a happy feeling. <laughs> the sense that whoever did this kind of knew what they were doing. And again, she, she won't necessarily express it that way. But that's, that's, that is what in fact will give her that feeling is the the confidence of the stroke, and in this case now the play of light. And again, I, you know, forgive me, I don't, I do not at all think that this is, what should I say, 
<laughs> high quality or something fancy. It's just it's just what needs to be done. It is it's just part of the job. Being being an illustrator. Tomorrow, I hope to paint out in the driveway. Hope to get started doing a painting. Why in the driveway? Because the painting is, the canvas is seven feet tall. We have nine foot ceilings downstairs in my downstairs studio. So do the math. <laughs> if, I, if I'm trying to do a seven foot painting in a nine foot room, uh, I have one foot off the floor and one foot short of the ceiling. That is not very much. So, especially if I want to throw paint around, which I, as you know, I really do like to throw paint around. So I'm gonna start this painting. I can finish it perhaps in the, in the later stages when I'm calmed down a little bit. I can finish it in my studio one foot off the floor and one foot off the ceiling. But I really can't start it there because I do I like to throw paint around. So tomorrow, beautiful day here in Central North Carolina. While it was 56 degrees below zero in Chicago last week, wind chill. Here around here, it got all the way down to 19 or 20 or something like that. <laughs> Pretty mild compared to up north, but pretty cold for, for us southerners with our thin blood and skinny coats. <laughs> I, I grew up up north. I was born in Canada. I grew up mostly in Michigan. <coughs> Let me pick on my fellow southerners for a while, just for a minute. One, one of the things that has always greatly mystified me about southerners in cold weather is it seems to me if you were really, because most of them don't like snow and cold weather, which I, again, it's unfortunate for them. But anyway, um, a lot of complaining goes on when snow falls. Not in my house. A lot of rejoicing goes on when it snow falls. But uh, I would have thought that Southerners, and I guess I'm thinking mostly of women here. Forgive me if I'm being sexist, but... I'm just being realistic. Uh, I would I would have thought that most Southerners, when it got cold out, that they would really put on warm, warm coats, like, you know, maybe overdo it. And hats, gloves, scarves, thick coats, you know, because they don't like the cold. So if you don't like the cold, put on warm clothes. Now, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but my experience has been the very opposite of that. <laughs> For some reason... Southerners, maybe Southern women, really don't want to put on warm clothes, which mystifies me. It's like, what? I thought you didn't like the cold. I don't. Well, then why don't you dress up? And I think it's because it'll mess up their hair or something. Like, forgive me. And maybe I really have stip, trip, stip, stepped over into sexist. <laughs> well, I've been told that. I'm not making that part up. They don't want to put on big coats because it will mess up their hair. <laughs> ah, bless their little hearts. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I see some comments. I just glanced up and saw Wright, my buddy Wright, who owns a car wash. <laughs> yeah, he calls snow white gold. I'm with you. But you know what? I had actually had an artist say to me the other day, because uh, we were talking about Generally speaking, artists are, are fairly visually sensitive. I mean, that is sensitive to all visual things, not just to artwork. They're, they're, and that has certainly been my experience for my entire life. You know, if there's a beautiful sunset and there's five people in the car, I'm the one who says, oh man, look at that sunset. Or if the fall colors are beautiful, I say, oh man, look at those leaves. Or if the snow is falling, you say, oh, that is so beautiful, okay? And I had a, an artist, we were visiting together, and, and she confirmed that, that impression, that, that she used this as an example of, yeah, artists are more sensitive, visually sensitive to everything, the good, the bad, the ugly. And so it may be that my 
ecstasy <laughs> when it starts to snow is connected to the fact that I'm so visually sensitive. Yeah. Now, so I really do, I miss uh, snow from, from my youth. I, I'll quick, quick to add though, what I don't miss is snow in late March, April, and May. <laughs> and all you northerners <laughs> know of what I speak. <laughs> so yeah, it, it, it definitely got old. Uh, definitely, definitely. So I would like snow right when I like it. <laughs> you know, in December and January and early February. But here it is. It's, we're in early February and it's going to be 70 degrees or close to 70 tomorrow. And it's, it's, it's uh, pretty hard to complain about 70 degree weather on, on uh, February 5th. David, you really have five feet of snow. Are you serious? Or that's how much you've gotten this year. Okay, so I'm completely envious. <laughs> I wish, I really do wish I could fly in for a visit. And uh, I, I'm not so old that I don't remember shoveling snow. But my assumption is that all you guys have snowblowers now. <laughs> I know that's not, I know not everybody does, but most people do. But yeah, as a young man, I mean, it was it literally, not literally, okay. It was, it was backbreaking work, and I don't mean that literally. But it was very, it's shoveling is very hard work. So... My heart does go out to those of you who have to shovel. And while I'm on the subject, while, while I ramble on, <laughs> I got to ramble about something. I do remember t many, many, many terrifying moments. Well, I should say I don't remember many of them. I've forgotten most of them. But I do remember that there were many terrifying moments driving. I remember driving in northern Michigan. I lived, for those of you who care, I, I lived in Petoskey, Michigan. My fate, one of my favorite places in the whole world. If you haven't visited Petoskey, that should be on your bucket list. Petoskey and Harbor Springs and Mackinac. All three, all three should be done on the same trip. Anyway, I remember driving through the country, daytime, in a heavy snow, heavy snowfall. And you southerners might have a hard time believing this, but all you northerners know exactly that you literally could not tell where the edge of the road was. You could not see. There was no marker to indicate the edge of the road, and you could only see, you know, 40 feet in front of you. The only way you could try to guess where the, where the road was was by looking at the gray bank of trees to your left and your right and try to stay in the middle of those two banks of trees. And, yeah, that was scary. But once you got where you were going, it was beautiful. <laughs> That's my story, and I'm sticking with it. Okay, I'm back to doing just a little bit more uh, pen and ink here. And I'm, I'm getting pretty close to finished, of course. I trust you can see that. So the question is, will the client... Look, I just saw something that needs painting. Hang on. Will the client look at all this and smile and say, Oh, that's going to look lovely. <laughs> she will say that only if she's the type of person that habitually over enunciates her words, <laughs> like I just did. Oh, that is going to look lovely. <laughs> Don't laugh. There's some people that do that. <laughs> Evidently, I do it on occasion. <laughs> Uh, all right. So back and forth, back and forth, back and forth between gouache, watercolor, and pen. That's, that's the technique I use, and I, I don't think, I don't imagine that I'm unique or unusual in that regard. By the way, I'm using a new, a new toy, new tool today. Do you notice the straight down camera angle? 
Isn't that fun? I built a tripod, so to speak. That's not a tripod. But I built a structure that will hold my camera. In fact, holds more than one camera. So hopefully here very soon I will start broadcasting on more than one platform at a time with a GoPro and a Mevo both. here in the grass. Of course, if their yard were perfect, there would be no marks down here whatsoever. But <laughs> Now, sometimes, is this one of those cases? Sometimes I will sign a, a little sketch like this, um, not because I'm particularly proud, which frankly, I'm not. This is just a, a grunt job do the just get her done kind of thing will never appear in any portfolio or website or anything like that um, but I will sign it because that will convey to the the owner of the house that oh this was done by a real artist person does that make sense so I'll probably do that today we just win, help my client win a few extra points. Yeah, go, I'll go ahead and do it right now. So she'll think I'm particularly proud of this illustration. It'll just be our little secret that I'm not. It's okay. I'm not complaining. It is what it is. All right. Hey, let me uh, move you guys and uh, look at your comments. Thank you for. Thank you for your chat. Whoa, a lot of chat, a lot of comments. Wow. Thank you, guys. <laughs> right? <I> got, <laughs> we've, we have since, Wright and I have since spoken about my, he's bought me a, uh, do not, don't, don be, buy a computer. <laughs> Wright has bought me a movie clapper <laughs> for Christmas. Can't wait to get it. Uh, the chimney seems flat. It does indeed. And, and that's because of perspective, I think. Well, you know what I could do? Oh, here. I'm moving you around. Earthquake. I could do something like this. Um, yeah, not a, bad, not a bad call, David. Just a little sliver of edge over here. Might make it seem a little better. What do you think? Does that look better? Yeah, it does actually. Thank you. My crazy friend David, who's all <laughs> he's always giving uh, uh, good good critiques. <laughs> Got your email this morning, David. I'm not sure that I understand it, but my friend, it's I've, you've always been. I've always enjoyed your comments. I don't agree with every single one, but most of the time, most of the time, your observations are quite good. So carry on, carry on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for saying that. That that's an improvement. Okay, back to me. <laughs> Enough about you. Let's talk about me again. <laughs> uh, glad I saw that, David. And yeah, right. I see. Right agrees with David. Um, I hope that fixes it. I, I think it does. And right, who owns a car wash, says snow is white gold. Good for you. Oh, thank you, Terry. <laughs> Giving me the definition of um, a plum, or it was either a plum or no, it wasn't. That was the other one. Um, it'll come back to me. Now I forgot the word, Terry. <laughs> but here's the definition. I mean, yeah, here's the definition of that, of that word. It is a grand or flamboyant manner, verb, style, flair. The actor who would play Serrano must have panache. That's the word, panache. <laughs> Thank you. I have got the best viewers in the world. 
<laughs> Thank you, Terry. A grand panache of grand or flamboyant manner. Exactly. That's sort of, sort of I have to paint. So you have to paint. That's what was done with that. David, five feet of snow. Yeah, Thinker 888. I'll let you know if I hear what the, what the, uh, what the uh, client's reaction is. Hey David, I'm I'm working on. Believe me, I I'm I spent much of the morning building a contraption that you guys are sitting on right now, um, that holds uh, a GoPro camera <coughs> and a Mevo camera at the same time, and I'm doing my darndest to try to figure out how to broadcast on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, and eventually Twitch all at the same time. So I am working on it. I've got a lot of plates spinning. Appreciate your your encouragement and your presence and your help, and uh, I'll call this uh, a, a, a wrap. If you enjoy this, please like, comment, share. If you don't enjoy this, let's just keep that between you and me. <laughs> All right, it's been fun again. Thank you for your company. I might do another broadcast tonight. I've got several projects. On, on, on in operation here, uh, one of which is calligraphy, and I I haven't done a calligraphy broadcast in ages, years probably. Uh, so I would enjoy doing that. Then I've got another illustration job and another architectural rendering. But thank you so much for your company. Appreciate it, and look forward to next time. Bye bye.